Okay, so the next part of the plan is for post-authorization effectiveness study. So remember we talked briefly about the difference between efficacy, that's our best treatment effect under very controlled conditions in a very, very narrow study population. Whereas effectiveness is the effect that we actually get under routine clinical care. And at the point of licensing, if there is some doubt over how this if efficacy translates into effectiveness, again, the regulatory authority can insist that as a part of the license, the company does further studies to demonstrate the effect in routine care. This is a very recent development in drug regulation that has made it very um, important that the efficacy that they demonstrate at the point of licensing does translate into real world effects. And there can be all sorts of reasons why at the point of licensing we may not know the true effect and this can be due to things like surrogate endpoints. So for example we may have uh, a new treatment to lower cholesterol. Well we may want to lower cholesterol, in fact we will only want to lower cholesterol because we hope we will prevent future myocardial infarctions or stroke. But it may be that the trial didn't demonstrate that clinical benefit. Well, the regulators could then insist that a future study be done to demonstrate the clinical benefit. Um, vaccines will typically demonstrate an immunological response as part of the licensing process, but they won't have been tested on an entire population within a country, which is what really matters for some vaccines is that we're lowering the level of an infection at the population level. So it may then be important that the company commits to doing, in different countries in the world, these studies to demonstrate how the vaccine is working. Okay? The conditions of care under, under routine care can be quite different to in a randomised trial. And maybe as part of the treatment, it's important that you're regularly measuring something to do with the patient. So let's say it's a trial in HIV. It may be important that you're able to measure maybe CD4 count because it may lead you to make different changes to the patient's treatment. And you'll do that very well potentially in randomised trials, but maybe in routine care, you don't get to see the patient as often and it could be that the effectiveness is lower in routine care than it would be under trial conditions. And then it could be that as the, as the treatment is available for a few years, for some other reason, new information comes to light that means that we need to re-evaluate effectiveness. So there could be lots of reasons why we want to know more about effectiveness. Okay, so moving on to the, the final part of the plan that I think is of great interest is risk minimization. Now, we've already mentioned some of these. So risk minimization is when we want to prevent or to reduce identified risks. And so a really great example is a pregnancy prevention plan. Uh, a, a good example of one that's been had difficulties recently is sodium valproate, so treatment for epilepsy. And we've known that there are problems with valproate causing birth defects for a long time. But we haven't necessarily been as effective as we thought in preventing pregnancy in women who take valproate. Another good example is the antipsychotic treatment clozapine. So this is a, a very effective treatment, but it's also quite toxic and can cause very nasty white blood cell problems and in extreme cases can cause death due to a granulocytosis. So this was discovered back in the 1970s, I think, and so it soon became apparent that you could only give this treatment to people if they were having regular monitoring of their white blood cell counts. 
So it became uh, a requirement that all patients taking clozapine had to have proved that they had a test that showed their white cell count was good before the pharmacist would release their next box of clozapine. So in fact, this all hinged on the pharmacist. The doctor would make the prescription, but the pharmacist would not give the treatment unless the patient produced this blood cell count that was okay. And this has been a phenomenally effective way of allowing people to benefit from receiving clozapine, but without the catastrophic effects on white blood cell counts. Another great example is in the world of HIV and a, a treatment called a Bacavir. Now Bacavir again, when it was launched in the 1990s, was a very effective antiretroviral, but it also caused uh, an adverse reaction, an allergic reaction, in about 4% of people exposed to the treatment. Now usually, most people would just have a fairly mild allergic reaction. But if they ever received a Bacavir again, it would be a much more severe reaction and often was fatal. Now, this was another position where you had potentially a very effective treatment, but also potentially a very toxic treatment. And eventually it was realized that I think pretty much everybody who had the allergic response also carried a particular genetic allele, which was easily tested for. And so as soon as the, the company introduced testing, this genetic testing, it meant that people would then be safe to receive a Bacavir and wouldn't have the allergic reaction. So these are all examples of risk minimization measures. And we can put those in place, but we need to do more than that. We need to prove that they've had the desired effect. And so we often need to do studies to show that these have been effective measures, okay?